Good morning, everyone. Delighted to welcome you to our Embrace Aging session today. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we are gathering here today in Kelowna is the un traditional unceded territory of the Silk Okanagan Nation and their peoples. I also acknowledge that some of you might be joining us from both near and far. And I wanna take this moment to actually acknowledge the traditional owners past and present of those lands as well. My name is Joan Batorf. I'm a professor in the School of Nursing here at UBC's Okanagan campus and director of the Institute for Healthy Living and Chronic Disease Prevention. We're delighted to welcome you to one more of our sessions in our eighth annual Okanagan Embrace Aging Month of March. So thank you very much for joining us today. Embrace Aging was an initiative uh, co-hosted by the Institute for Healthy Living and Chronic Disease Prevention at UBC Okanagan, Interior Health, and Interior Savings Credit Union. We launched this initiative eight years ago to celebrate and raise awareness about positive aging. And once again, it continues to grow each year. And as you've known, if you've attended any of our previous events this month, we organized a wide range of educational opportunities over the past month of March. Our sessions are really designed for everyone, young and old alike. And as you will have noticed, they focus on a variety of healthy aging topics and ways to improve quality of life for everyone, seniors, family caregivers, and really our goal is to inspire everyone to embrace positive aging. You will notice there's a closed captioning box at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can move that anywhere you want on your screen by just clicking and dragging it uh, to a more convenient spot. If you find it distracting, you can also turn it off. The bottom of your screen, if you hover, there's uh, you'll find a live transcript button that you can click on and turn off the closed captioning. You'll also notice that there's an, a chat um, icon and we welcome your comments and questions at any time during the session. And we'd be happy to read them out to our speaker at the end of the session and invite uh, conversation about our topic. So I'm really delighted today to welcome Dr. Vicki Komishar, who is uh, one of our new assistant professors uh, in Mechanical, in the School of Engineering, Faculty of Applied Science, right here at UBC's Okanagan campus. She is going to talk to us today about some of her research in falls prevention. She's had a longstanding interest in preventing age-related injuries for older adults and has been using her knowledge of engineering and her research expertise to help us figure this all out. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Commissar. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Joan, for the introduction, and thank you all for coming today. Um, I'm very excited to be here to talk about um, a range of projects, really, that um, deal with um, the risk for falls and fall-related injuries. Um, so without further ado, we can get this started. Okay, so to kick this off, I wanted to stay away from the typical graphs that show you the nightmare of what falls are like and instead throw a question to everyone in the audience. Um, if you could please type your responses into the chat box, that would be very much appreciated. Um, so who's your favorite superhero and why? Oh man, this is a bit of a challenge. Wonder Woman, okay. Green Lantern, willpower, absence of fear. Wonder Woman for strength. That's huge. My mom, yes. <laughs> we, uh, we have that shared. Um, Mother Teresa, Hulk, he's a man. <laughs> uh, Spider-Man can stick to many surfaces. That, that'd be awesome for staying upright. Um, I, I dream of that talent as well. Um, okay, lots of good responses here. 
Uh, my next question is a bit different. Um, so one last one here, Jesus, always a powerful aspect to my life. Um, I'm, I'm glad we've got a range of um, groups here from uh, uh, and different perspectives. So my next question um, is to all of you, in which ways are you a superhero to other people? Um, so, you know, if we think about it, we all play a really important role in the lives of others. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on how you achieve that in, in the world around you. All right, seeing responses come in. Perseverance and compassion, people look to me for positivity and support, being helpful, um, listening and comfort, advocacy of those in need in healthcare, more advocacy, excellent to see you here. Um, okay, so we've got, again, a range of others, um, being helpful for others, empathy as needed. I think that's so important now. Um, being kind and taking time, um, again, just so important. Um, supporting family and aging in place, being non-judgmental, being accepting, being positive outlook. Um, these, these are wonderful. Thank you for sharing. Um, so the reason why I ask this is, um, you know, I think a lot of us are here to learn more about positive and healthy aging and um, really how we can continue to be a superhero in the lives of others around us and continue to live our lives as, as independently and with as much autonomy as possible. Um, and it follows from this that um, I think there's a very common goal to avoid falls and fall related injuries um, and to avoid the sorts of, of um, traumatic events that can really threaten our autonomy and independence and challenge our ability to um, to remain, uh, to continue to have the impact that we do in terms of being superheroes. Um, so a big part of this is helping, um, or sorry, a big part of why I'm in this line of work is to help other people to um, preserve this role in, in the lives of others around them. So very quick overview of what we'll talk about for the sciencey part of the session. Um, so the first I'll, I'll do a little bit on the importance of fall and injury prevention and several of you are aware of this already by virtue of you being here. Um, I'll talk a bit about strategies to prevent falls and improve balance with better technology and task design. Um, I'll talk a little bit also about um, some early work on preventing fall related injuries through better technology use and a few individual factors that are important. Um, and then we'll wrap up with a few lines here on how you can get uh, involved in this work, um, whether it's from a research perspective, um, in terms of partnering on studies or participating in them as they come up in the next little while. Uh, so, so start off, why are we here? Um, well, the rate of fall related injuries in older adults in Canada is rising. Um, so I have some fairly sobering statistics and this is a slightly out of date graph, but I think still relevant. And it shows the rate of fall related injuries in older adults in Canada. And what we can see is this is going up from year to year. Um, in 2010, over 250,000 older adults in Canada experienced an injury from a fall. And what this tells me is that despite our best efforts to develop good programs for fall and injury prevention, at a population level, I'm not really seeing any evidence that these are working. Um, and it tells me that complementary strategies and better evidence is needed to inform fall and injury prevention strategies um, and prevent older adults from getting hurt from these events. Um, this really struck me, and again, it's old data, but still relevant. Um, not only are older adults at a higher risk for falls and injuries, but the consequences of these injuries can get more severe. Um, so what I'm showing you here are data from the Canadian Institutes of Health Information. Um, and this is the head injury rate per 100,000 in Canada. And we can see that in, um, uh, for adults under the age of 59, um, the rates are similar-ish for head injuries due to falls and motor vehicle collisions. And then once we surpass the age of 60, we see that um, the rate of head injuries really goes up due to falls in older adults. Um, and to me, this just reinforces the importance of developing better strategies for injury prevention. Um, before we go a bit further, I 
really wanted to also reinforce, and I'm sure that many of you also feel the same way, that discouraging mobility is really not a good solution for preventing injuries. Um, I found this gem of an article from 1947, um, where in fact the dangers of immobility and um, lack of activity are actually fairly well established in the literature. Um, and some of these dangers can include bed sores, muscle loss, bone loss, functional incontinence. So what this is, is when people are able to retain uh, bladder or bowel control and then, um, but they can't actually access the bathroom. So they're technically incontinent. Um, depression due to loss of independence. And then of course, an increased risk for falls because of, um, uh, because of all these physiological changes. And we're seeing this, I don't have this in the, uh, today's presentation, but in the higher rate of fall related injuries uh, due to COVID and that's being attributed in part due to um, lack of physical activity in, in older adults. Um, so to me, this reinforces the importance of um, coming up with solutions that not only work for injury prevention, but also that allow um, older adults to remain as healthy and active as possible. So um, when I work through injury prevention, I usually like to think of this as three areas for intervention if the goal is to stop people from getting hurt from falls. Um, so the first is on the left and it's to prevent balance loss during challenging and important. Um, I've written essential, but essential can mean a lot of different things to different people. Um, the key point is that we want to prevent balance loss um, and stop someone from losing balance in the first place. Um, the next part is in the middle and part of the goal is also to improve balance recovery should balance loss occur. So this might be if you have a little stumble, you might grab the handrail, that's a balance recovery reaction and ultimately the person is able to avoid the fall. The last piece is one that a lot of people won't necessarily think of, um, but the complementary goal of preventing injury should balance recovery fail. Um, so even though falls are common in older adults, um, very, a, a relatively small percentage of these falls actually result in injury. Um, and there are steps that you can take to reduce the risk of getting hurt should these falls occur, which we'll talk, to, talk about in a bit. So I'll start by discussing some of our fall prevention approaches. Um, this will cover both a recent literature review that I did with a colleague of mine, or with colleagues of mine in Michigan and Waterloo. Um, as well as some somewhat recent data from um, laboratories uh, in Toronto that's emerged in the last five years. Um, so just a very quick overview that walkways are a high risk location for fall related injuries in older adults. Um, we can see again, this is from the Public Health Agency of Canada that um, about 13% of falls occur on stairs um, and about 45% of fall related injuries occur when people are walking on any other surface. Um, so one of the questions that we've asked is, can better task and product design prevent balance loss and improve balance recovery? Um, so I'll talk briefly about some task related factors that can challenge balance control and recovery. And this is really summarizing from a literature review that I did with colleagues um, about a year and a half ago. Um, so the essential point is that what you do matters for balance. Um, doing some other tasks such as talking or thinking um, can uh, challenge both balance control. And we've seen in some recent evidence from a laboratory in um, Maryland um, that uh, taking on a cognitive task um, in older adults um, can also challenge the accuracy with which they can grasp a nearby handrail um, after losing balance. Uh, so this speaks to the importance of awareness um, and how focusing on, on a certain task can make it harder to perceive hazards in the environment and respond to balance loss. Um, I also want to focus a bit on the image in the middle related to carrying a load, and this can be problematic because the load can block your ability to see what's um, on the ground in front of you. Um, but more importantly, it also precludes ability to um, grab fixtures in the environment um, should balance loss occur and you need to avoid a fall. Uh, so some very quick strategies to reduce task related risk for balance loss. Um, you might consider using carts for transporting loads and groceries to keep the hands free. Um, you might avoid distractions during high risk activities. So if you're walking down that flight of stairs or you see an icy patch on a hiking trail, that might be the time to avoid talking um, 
because the uh, importance of focus is, or sorry, because focus is more important there. Um, and then in cases where fall risk hazards can't be removed, um, it can be valuable to mark those so that they're visible because simply paying attention is not reliable, a reliable strategy for fall prevention. Um, I also want to talk very, very briefly on footwear for balance control and recovery. Um, I see that Steve Perry is on the line here and he's welcome to jump in and supplement my butchering of the field. Um, for those who don't know, he's an expert on, on footwear design based out of Wilfrid Laurier University. Um, so this is again some findings from a literature review um, and simply uh, looking at outsole materials, um, you might want to look for rubber soles and groove soles because these can increase slip resistance when contaminants are present. Um, boot stiffness is important. So this is a study that came out of the University of Mississippi um, and they found in the context of bounce perturbations that ankle support can increase stability during small bounce disturbances. Um, the size of the outsole matters. So this is the width of the shoe on the bottom um, and simply that wider soles can increase stability. This was actually verified by shaking people around inside a laboratory. Um, that work was published in 2015. Um, and then finally, rocker bottoms. So this is when you have a super round sole, um, can make it a lot more challenging to recover balance and to maintain balance. Um, so it's a design you might want to look to avoid in, in making your selections. Um, so when, when picking footwear, um, just a very quick summary that uh, it can be good to avoid hard plastic soles because those can be challenging for maintaining grip in the winter. Um, uh, Metal pleats can work really well on ice, but they tend not to work on concrete and other surfaces. So be careful when using those when walking. Um, and then finally, a really important point here is that the slip resistance of a piece of footwear can't actually be determined by looking simply at the sole. Um, so I put a link here for winter footwear, and this is based out of Toronto. And the team here actually has rated a whole range of boots um, for the slip resistance on ice and snow. Um, using real testing on ice and snow rather than other conventional methods. Um, so the link here is ratemytreads.com and that's when you might want to look to when making your footwear decisions for um, next winter or the remaining parts of the spring here. Okay, um, I'll move on now to talking a bit about the built environment. Um, so, uh, these are some studies that really excite me because they've actually led to changes in policy. So we'll talk a bit about that. Um, so looking at stairways, and again, these are where about 13% of falls that lead to injuries occur. Um, so the take home message for the next section is kind of illustrated here, um, where the fall risk on stairs is directly related to the run length. So this is just the part of the stairs that um, your foot is on. I've tried to show it in this illustration in the top right corner. Um, and what I'm showing you here are data from the United Kingdom. Um, this was a study done by Wright and Roy's about 10 years ago. And what they did was they sent out postcards to about 10,000 people in the United Kingdom. Um, that asked two questions. So first, um, have you fallen on a flight of stairs? And second, how long were the steps that you fell on? And they received six times as many um, postcards for um, stairs that were 190 to 200 millimeters um, compared to those that were 250 to 260 millimeters. And for context, um, this is where the Canadian building code previously sat at about 210 millimeters. So still fairly high on the um, risk scale. So you can see there's a fair bit of room for improvement here. Um, one question that some of my colleagues and I asked in the laboratory is whether stairway run length and rise height affected stability during stair walking. Um, so I have some images of staircases here and it's a bit difficult to see, but the um, rise height on the steps is different and these are length adjustable so that we can change the run length of a staircase and get an understanding of the biomechanical mechanisms behind the data that came out of the United Kingdom. Um, so yeah, length adjustable staircases. Um, you can also sort of see it's not the best picture, but there's a safety harness to prevent actual falls in participants. So we did have a number of older adults take part in the study. Um, not shown here, um, everyone wore 3D motion capture markers and that allowed us to get a sense of um, 
uh, characteristics like toe clearance and center of mass control as they went up and down the staircase. So I'll walk quickly through some of the important findings. Um, the first was that as stairway run length increased, um, participants walked more quickly during stair descent. So what I'm showing you here is um, the anterior center of mass velocity. And as the run length goes up, we can see that people were walking faster. And what this tells us is that they were more comfortable and confident in going down the staircase with higher walking speed. Um, so it is a more risky strategy, but it also indicated better perceived safety. Uh, the other part that was really interesting, we took a look at the distance between the center of mass and the anterior edge of the step. So that's kind of shown on the right here. Um, and the idea is that the closer the center of mass is to the anterior edge of the step, the higher risk of a person is of overstepping and falling forward. And what we found was that um, even though participants were descending longer steps more quickly, they maintained a greater distance from the step edge once you got above 10 inches here. So um, in other words, they were able to um, use safer walking strategies while going down the stairs, um, even though they were walking more quickly. Um, the last piece of evidence that was really important is that people also maintained a more upright posture when descending longer steps. Um, so what I'm showing here is a bit of a mess of a graph with um, sagittal upper body tilt. So that's simply the person's trunk inclination on the right as they're going down. Um, and we can see that as um, the person or as the uh, length of the stairways went up, people were able to maintain more upright. And that explains a lot of our center of mass control findings. Um, okay, sorry, I'm seeing this comment here. I'll slow that down. <laughs> Thank you very much for the, for the feedback. Um, so ultimately, um, just to summarize what, what I showed you there, um, as the length of the stairs got longer, people were able to go down them more quickly and more confidently, um, but they were also to, able to use a safer strategy with their center of mass further away from the step edge. Um, and one of the aspects that really excited me here is that this was evidence that um, we were able to actually bring to building code committees um, and pushed for a change in the Canadian National Building Code. Um, so this took place in 2015. And um, as of 2015, the national uh, minimum for stair length is 260 millimeters. Um, what I will qualify here is that um, there's still a fair bit of ways to go in Canada. So the international standards that are in place in other parts of the world, including several uh, states in the US are actually a lot stricter than Canada's. Um, so the International Building Code minimum is 279 millimeters. This corresponds to about 11 inches. And that's not even on this chart here. Um, so we can see that in Canada, the, Canada, there's actually a way to go to make stairs safer. Um, and that will be a goal to push for the next uh, successive code cycles. I wanted to talk a bit about strategies to make our stairs and walkways safer without ripping out existing staircases, because it's not always practical to be like, oh, my staircase is too short, I better renovate my entire house. Um, so some very quick strategies related to the staircase itself. Um, here's some recent data from, again, from Toronto. Um, so first is you can add uh, nosings. Um, so these are just add-ons to put on the edge of the step, and this increases the effective length. Um, and if you pick nosings that are round um, or have sort of a tapered edge to them, this can increase the effective length of the step. Um, and it's a much less expensive option than making an entirely new staircase that's longer. Um, the other part that's really important is increasing the color contrast at the edge of each step. So we can see that in the image here that there's a white strip um, that contrasts with the rest of the staircase. And that just makes it easier to see where the step edge is. Um, and that has been shown to improve balance control and toe clearance during stair descent. Um, I want to talk also a bit about handrail design. Um, so this is also kind of exciting and I'll show you the reasons why in a bit. Um, so it's another addition that you can add to a staircase to improve balance recovery as long as the design of the rail itself can enable fast and accurate grasping. Um, and up until quite recently, this is actually a fairly difficult thing to test in practice. Um, 
because of the challenge of getting good data on balanced challenge, challenging situations with handrails. I'm sure you can appreciate that it's not really practical to go to people and push them down a flight of stairs and vary the handrail design and hope for the best. Um, so we've had to come, come up with different ways of exploring this question in practice. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about uh, handrail height in this context here because the findings here are not always that intuitive. Um, and the reason for this is because the trade-off between speed and effectiveness in grasping can make it difficult to know in advance where the best place is to install a handrail. Um, so we can see on the left here that um, we have a high handrail beside this person who's standing in the green, and we can see that it's far from his hand, and that might make it difficult to reach quickly. Um, the problem, of course, is that if you go the other way, so we have this example on the right here where we have a relatively low handrail. Um, so this is, that one here is installed 31 inches above the stairway step edge, and that's actually not code compliant. Um, but this can be very difficult to grasp and generate strength with when the person's arm is fully extended or stretched out. Um, so if you can think of when you try to pick anything up with your arm fully extended, how that's difficult compared to when it's bent. And the same sort of logic applies here. Um, so we actually addressed this question experimentally, and this was done using the setup in Toronto that's shown here in these images. So on the left, we have a cube. This is actually a flight simulator that's used for studying balance and other um, fall relevant uh, questions. Um, and the idea is that the cube itself can shake and destabilize someone, and we can then systematically look at or vary the setups inside to see how people recover from balance loss. Um, so in this image here, this is actually my dad. He really wanted to be famous cross country, so here we are. Um, in this case, he volunteered to be in a study related to handrail height. He's wearing a safety harness. Um, that's attached to the ceiling to stop him from experiencing an actual fall. Um, we also have 3D motion capture around the walls and this was to measure characteristics like his center of mass control. He's wearing muscle sensors to measure reaction time. Um, and we also put a layer of fabric on the sole of his shoe to make this uh, walk to make the shoes a bit more slippery. And the reason for this was to make it harder for him to be able to step and recover from balance loss. Um, so it made him a bit more reliant on the handrail um, to, to recover from a destabilization. So for the study I'm going to show you, this one looked at handrail height. So we varied um, between 30 and 44 inches and tested on um, some younger and older people. Um, I'll show you a video of what this looks like. Um, so remember that everything in here is taking place inside the shaking cube, but because the cameras are mounted to the walls, you can't actually see the room shake. Um, so there's my dad, and when he walks, he will step on the trigger force plate that's kind of outlined in pink over here, and that's when the room shakes. And you can see that he loses balance and reaches to grab the handrail. Um, so I'll walk you through some of the results here, um, again, because they're not always that intuitive. Um, this actually surprised us. We found that there was no relationship between handrail contact time and um, handrail height, even though the distance from the person's hand was greater with higher handrails. Um, so what I'm showing you here is just a bunch of clouds of variability with no relationship. Um, and even after we normalized um, handrail heights to individual height, you still saw no relationship. It didn't matter if the person was younger or older. Um, there was no, no relationship there. Uh, what I'm showing you on the right is a measure called movement time. And this just measures the distance or the difference between um, when the person reacted to balance loss and we could see a reaction in the arm muscles um, and when they touched the handrail. And again, we saw very similar results and a lot of variability as um, handrail contact time after balance was lost. Um, so what this tells us is that higher handrails did not compromise contact time despite a greater distance from the handrail. Um, we wanted to learn a little bit about more about why this was the case. Um, so what we found was that um, 
people were very good at reaching more quickly and reaching more accurately for handrails that were further away. Um, so what I'm showing you here is handrail overshoot. Um, so this is just how far above the rail did someone reach um, when they were recovering from balance loss and that actually decreased as handrail height increased. Um, we also saw that the peak hand position increased with handrail height. So what this told us was that people were actually telling their responses quite closely to handrail design. And it wasn't simply a generic, um, like throw one's hands up in the air randomly response to balance loss. Um, so we thought that was a bit interesting. Um, we also saw, and I, I touched on this briefly earlier, that um, people also compensated for the greater hand to handrail distance by reaching upward more quickly. Um, so we saw that peak hand velocities increased as handrail height increased. Um, and that allowed them to essentially make up the time, make up for the time when in the cases where the rail was further away. Here's where things really got interesting. Um, and we saw that as um, handrail height increased, torso control improved up to a height of about 42 to 44 inches. Um, so what you're looking at here is trunk angles. Um, and one, the one on the left is uh, forward trunk movement. The one on the right is sideways trunk movement. Um, and lower trunk angles means that the person was able to stay more upright. And that was done the best when the handrail was higher, um, up to about 42 inches. Um, so bringing this all back together, um, what we found was that there was no effective rail height on contact or movement time. And this was important because it's a common question that comes up in, in building code meetings um, where there's a concern that if the rail is too high, people won't be able to grab it. And we found that was actually not the case. Um, we also found that higher handrails enabled better trunk control up to about 40 to 42 inches. Um, just for comparison here, I've thrown up some other design standards. Um, so the first is the BC building code range, and we can see that maxes out at 38 inches. I think that might have recently increased up to 42. Um, if so, it's, it, it would be a very recent increase within the last 12 months or so. Um, it's also noteworthy that accessible design standards tend to sit around 36 inches, which is again quite a bit lower than what we saw as the best heights for balance recovery. Um, so just to summarize a few aspects really to design here, um, with regard to height, we recommend that um, if you're in a place where there aren't going to be a lot of children um, or where children are likely to be able to reach what's around, um, fall risk can be reduced if you install as high as permitted within local building codes, up to about 42 inches, in which case the benefit stops being observed. Um, I also have a few other results here from other recent studies because shape and size do matter here. Um, and if you're picking a design, then round is also the best. Um, this allows the fingers to grip the underside of the handrail. And it also allows um, people and especially older adults to apply the highest forces and with the fewest errors. Um, so this is work that's emerging from, from colleagues. Um, and then finally, um, proactive use is also important. So I realize that this might feel a bit not ideal during a global pandemic, but if you're able to contact the rail proactively, and by this I mean hold it while walking, um, this can also help with preventing balance loss and improving recovery. And it um, allows you to skip the entire step of having to reach to grasp, which is important. Okay, um, so in the last few minutes here, I want to talk a little bit about some emerging evidence that focuses on preventing falls and fall, or sorry, preventing fall related injuries through um, a combination of technology and individual factors. Um, so just a few statistics to frame this. Um, again, falls are the leading cause of injury in older adults, but most falls are actually not injurious. Um, so about one in three older adults will fall each year, and in long-term care, that number actually increases to about one in two. Um, and unfortunately, 81% of hospital visits, or sorry, 81% of injury-related hospital visits are due to falls. Um, it's important to note that um, in the long-term care setting, and the stats I believe are better in the community, that about 74% of falls in long-term care don't actually result in injury. Um, so one of the big things that uh, I've really tried to focus on recently is figuring out what separates the 20, or sorry, what separates the 74% of falls that aren't injurious 
from the 26% of falls that are, and we can use that to drive prevention strategies. Um, so one thing to keep in mind is that if you think of the last time you fell, um, I'll make an educated guess that you probably stuck your arms out to stop the fall. Maybe you used your torso or your neck muscles to keep your head from the ground. Um, the essential point is that you probably didn't just flop down and allow your head to hit the surroundings without any sort of attempt to stop that from happening. Um, so we refer to these as protective responses. Um, so this can be often characterized by using the upper limbs to stop a fall um, and to prevent or reduce impact to the head and to the hips. Um, and these are really critical strategies for preventing fall related injuries um, and especially brain injuries that, that can occur when the head impacts other surfaces. Um, now, despite this, um, it's actually kind of an unfortunate statistic that in the long-term care setting, and again, community is a bit different, um, about one in three falls in this population can result in head impact. Um, so again, a major question is what, what can we do about this and what can we learn from um, falls in long-term care to develop injury prevention strategies? So the next few slides, we'll talk a bit about some of the work that I did with the, um, with the team at Simon Fraser University. Um, so this is led by Dr. Steve Rabinovich and I recently wrapped up a postdoctoral fellowship there. Um, and the reason why I went there is that they've actually been collecting videos of real life falls in older adults um, since 2007. So I haven't updated this in a bit, but actually there's over 3000 falls that have been collected in the last 15 years or so. Um, and these are coded using questionnaires to characterize key features of when the fall starts, what happens when the person is going down, um, and what happens when they land. So this is things like whether a body part impacts the ground or other objects. Um, and this information is combined with injury outcomes from incident reports and seven day follow ups. Um, and what this has done is it's allowed the team to get very high quality evidence on what really happens during a fall that you can't just glean from an incident report. Um, they actually found that there's errors in about 50% of incident reports um, compared to what's observed on video. So this is a nice way to get objective evidence on what's really happening. Um, so I'll show you an example of one of these falls and I'll warn you in advance that this one is pretty awful to watch. Um, so just kind of be warned. Um, so we have, Cases where a few of them are fairly simple and there's few obstacles. Um, and unfortunately, in this case, we see a person sticks her hands out, she tries to stop the fall, but unfortunately is unsuccessful, unfortunately is not successful in keeping her head from the ground. Um, so some of the questions that we started to ask is, um, what are the factors that uh, increase the risk for head impact um, and what can we do about it? So the first question we asked is how often do head impacts occur and what is what does this mean for injury and how does this relate to the risk for impact and injury to other body parts. Um, so what you're looking at here is just um, quick summative statistics of the relationship between um, impacts and injuries in long term care. So I'll direct your attention. Um, first of all, to the blue, and this just shows the number of times or the frequency of times that a person hit a body part on something, um, but there wasn't any injury. Um, and what I find really interesting about this is if you look in the middle, you can see the pelvis and the hips, and there's actually quite a bit of blue. So even though hip fractures can be um, fairly devastating injuries, um, when you compare the frequency of hip fractures to how often people impact their hips and pelvis in the environment, they're actually relatively rare. And in most cases, people are able to land in a way um, and hit body parts that are at low risk for injury. Um, I'll draw your attention now to the far left here. And this is a bit more, I guess, upsetting where we can see that there's a lot of red around the head. Um, so we actually observed head injuries in 37% of cases where impact occurred. Um, and not only that, but head impact was in 35% of falls. Um, 
so the head did not impact particularly frequently. Um, it was at least it was the least frequent body part to impact. Um, but when impact occurred, it was by far the most vulnerable body part for injury. Um, taken together, though, this we actually found these results really encouraging because they show us that um, when long-term care residents fell, um, most of the impacts were to body parts that didn't result in them getting hurt. Um, so they're less able to avoid hitting their head than younger adults and I'll assume older adults in the community. Um, but they're still able to avoid head impacts a lot more often than other body parts. So that, that part was, was good. We then want you to get a few more insights onto what were the circumstances of these head impacts and what were the ones that made them the most dangerous. Um, so we looked in particular a bit more closely at fall direction. Um, so what I'm showing you here is a mosaic plot that shows the relationship between fall direction and whether impacts occurred, um, and then if impacts occurred, whether the person experienced an injury. Um, so on the bottom here, we've got direction. So about 11% of the falls were forward. 53% um, of them were backwards. So that's in the middle here. And then 36% of, of them were sideways. So that's on the right. Um, and what should hopefully stand out is that there is a lot of red um, for forward. So there were 90 cases where the person hit their head and an injury was observed. And there were very few cases where um, there was an impact but no injury. Um, and together what this tells us is that um, not only did landing forward have the greatest risk for head impact, but also by far the greatest risk for head injury when impacts occurred. Um, and we actually saw that in the case of forward falls, um, 70, nearly 70% of these landings where there was an impact also involved a head injury, which was a bit terrifying. We then took a look at some of the factors that influenced the risk for head impact when people fell forward to see if we could reduce that frequency of head impact given how often injuries occur during forward falls. Um, so for this little study here, um, I did this with an undergraduate student at Simon Fraser. Um, we looked at the relationship between uh, landing posture. So this is simply where the person placed their hands when they fell um, and whether the head hit the ground. Um, and what we found was that 60% of simple forward falls, so this is where there's no obstructions in the environment, um, involve some form of head impact with the floor, um, but that the posture and hand position that people used when they landed mattered. Um, so what I'm showing you here on the left is we looked at where the hands were placed in the medial lateral direction, so it was by the shoulders or far out or closer in. Um, because this affects the shoulder torques that people can um, apply when they land. And we found that the best outcomes were when both hands were near the shoulder. So that's on the top here. Um, and that was associated with a threefold reduction to the odds for head impact compared to hands in the other landing positions. We also found that when both hands were superior to the shoulders, so this is when people landed with their hands sort of above the shoulders, um, that was associated with a fourfold reduction to the odds for head impact um, compared to landing with the hands directly underneath the shoulders, which I'm showing in the near position, um, or below them, um, so inferior. And to give you a sense of what ideal versus not ideal looks like, this was a case, an example here of a successful landing. So this gentleman has his hands um, approximately in the same um, medial or lateral position as his shoulders and with his hands in front of him. Um, and then by contrast, here was an example, I'm not showing the entire video here, but this was one that did result in head impact. And you can see that the person's hand position at landing is much more awkward. Um, the arms are way out. Um, it's hard to see from this angle, but the hands are actually below where the shoulders are. And that makes it very difficult for a person to successfully arrest a fall and, um, and be, uh, apply high muscle forces to um, stabilize a torso. Um, and one of the practical implications of this for your purposes is that um, we see that being able to use the arms to stop the fall is really important. And it means that strength and range of motion in the 
arms and core is actually really important. Um, so I know these, these are all easier said than done during the pandemic, but it to me reinforces the importance of maintaining a lot of upper limb strength. Um, and especially as you get older. Um, the last study that I want to touch on deals with technology use. Um, so we also took a look at how using technology such as walkers influence the risk for head impact. And what we found, first of all, was that um, a lot of falls did involve some kind of holding of an object. So that, that was typically weight bearing. Um, so in this example here, I'm showing a walker. Um, tables were pretty common. Uh, chairs were super common. Handrails were also observed. Um, and holding these weight bearing objects actually halved the odds for head impact. Um, so we found that was really exciting. We also found that when residents were able to maintain grasp of these objects before they landed, um, that reduced the risk for fall or head impact by one third, um, which is pretty notable. Um, so I'll show you an example here of a woman with a walker. Um, this one is less difficult to watch. Yeah, so we can see that she's slowly lowering herself to the ground. Um, we had about 225 falls that did involve walkers. So we were able to look at these as a standalone object um, and saw similar benefits compared to the other weight bearing objects. So um, we thought this was important because walker use can be pretty controversial. Um, but what we found was that using the walkers actually allowed older adults to fall more safely, even if they weren't able to avoid the fall. Um, and a big part of the benefit was seen in people who simply got tired as they were walking um, and had no other way of getting down to rest. Um, so something like this is still registered as a fall because she's unintentionally dropping to the ground, but we can see that she wasn't actually at huge risk of getting hurt because she was able to use the object to stabilize herself. Um, so just to summarize what I've shown you in this last little bit here, um, uh, I definitely say to try to maintain and improve strength and especially and range of motion and especially in the torso and upper limbs, um, because this will make it easier to protect the head during falls. Um, we also saw that holding weight bearing devices, including walkers and rollators can help with falling more safely. Um, so this might be important to consider if you're deciding whether or not to use one when you're kind of on the fence and not sure. Um, and it also means that when you're around the home, um, it can also be valuable to have things like furniture around to grab onto. Um, and even though it's not necessarily the best for staying up, um, it can still contribute to reducing head impact and injury risk. So I want you to wrap this up with a few information on how you can get involved before we start the question and answer. Um, so a few of us at UBCO were actually recently funded um, for a research cluster on aging in place. So a few of the investigators are on this call right now. Um, this work is being led by Dr. Jennifer Jacoby. And so I have included her email address here. Um, so we're always looking for people to work with in conceptualizing studies and in running studies. Um, so definitely get in touch if you're interested in getting into more of this work. Um, the other part that I wanted to bring up is that I'm new in town. Um, I'm still building my networks. Um, so I'm going to be ramping up efforts in fall and injury prevention in community, clinical, and occupational contexts. Um, I'm actually really interested in understanding how we can keep our workforce active for longer. Um, so if this is of interest to any of you, then feel free to shoot me an email. Um, and it would be great to have you on board for motivating study questions and for um, seeing these projects through to completion and translating evidence into the real world. So that wraps things up on my end and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Komasar. That is great to hear about this research. Uh, I must admit, I hadn't realized that um, that this much research was going on into falls and exactly how you did it. That little cube was was very interesting uh, uh, way to evaluate falls. Uh, there are some questions already. 
And I encourage people to put their comments and questions in the chat box. The first is from Sally. Why do you think the number of people who fall is increasing year on year? Is it simply because people are living longer and therefore there are more people over 65 each year? Any thoughts um, about that? that? That is an excellent question. Um, I think that's entirely reasonable. Um, yeah, I, I don't have a good answer for the population demographics on it. I think at the end of the day, however, um, our healthcare system doesn't care that people are living longer. We still have an increasing number of injuries on our hands. And I think a collective responsibility to deal with them um, as a society. Um, yeah, I, I think that's a reasonable question, uh, but I'll, I'll be honest, I, I don't have a good answer for that. Um, we do know that the frequency of fall-related injuries does get does increase as people reach older stages. Um, we see in long-term care that, um, well, no, I shouldn't say that uh, because the, the injury rates there do also get kind of mitigated by increased use of mobility aids, which sort of makes up for um, other losses of function. Um, yeah, sorry, <laughs> that, that's totally not a satisfying answer, but. Um, I think at the end of the day, we still do need to come up with strategies to address this public health issue that that won't go away um, as as our proportion of older adults increases year to year. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And in our region in particular, we have quite a high proportion of older adults. So uh, really an important issue for for the Okanagan and yeah. in our area, for sure. One so, stat actually, um, this actually just cross my mind. Um, I did look at the stats can for this. And one thing that I found was interesting is that our workforce is getting older. So the proportion of adults over the age of 55 in our workforce has been increasing steadily year to year. Um, so it might be a combination of people are living longer, but also staying active and in, you know, high engagement activities for longer. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Barb asks, uh, comments and says, this is really interesting about upper body strength. We'll keep using my weights. <laughs> had wondered why I had been sent home with weights and bands. Just thought squats and walking were necessary. I don't know if you want to add any comments to that. What people can do to help maintain their upper body strength. Yeah. Um, so I think what's important there, and this is where um, evidence on the relationship between upper body strength and head impact from fall risk is very challenging to collect because the sample size is needed to get power. Um, but based on what we've seen from the videos, I think we can get a fairly good sense of what, where it's important to maintain strength. Um, and I think the biggest one that people won't always remember is that um, the triceps are probably the most important muscle for keeping the head from the ground. So think of doing like a reverse push-up. Um, so I know some trainers in the Vancouver area will recommend things like wall presses to increase tricep strength. Um, so make sure that you do that in addition to biceps. Yeah, great suggestion. Um, Kara says, I work with caregivers. I'd love to have an info sheet that I can send out to people so they can keep their loved ones safe while they're living in the community rather than in care. And I know you're doing some work as well in terms of making homes safer uh, and preventing falls. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I think that's that's a very useful uh, knowledge product. Um, I know Toronto Rehab will release what they call mobility moments. So these are like one pagers that will summarize one to two cool pieces of evidence that have some practical implication for um, staying mobile and active in a safe way. Um, yeah, I, I, I can take this cue right now. Um, the other thing is that, um, I think we have everyone's email address, if that's correct. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's two recent reviews, one that I did with, um, Carolyn Duncan and Bill McElroy out of Michigan and, um, Michigan Tech and Waterloo respectively. Um, so that's out. We could send it around if people want it. It's framed for occupational falls, but everything is still applicable to the community. Um, 
The other thing is that um, Steve Rabinovich and I actually just had a paper accepted on um, biomechanics of fall related fracture prevention. And we'd be happy to share that with folks in the audience if, if anyone wants a PDF of it. Um, yeah, so, so share those with us, those uh, links. We can certainly share them with people who attended. That's not a problem as well. Excellent. Yeah. And we yeah. can we can work toward this info sheet. It's a it's a great product for a aging in place website. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll so we'll add that to the list. <laughs> great suggestion. Thanks, Kara. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I've got a question. I'm kind of wondering about those handrails. So, I, you know, you did that research in that cube, right? Yeah. And so and we saw the picture of your dad and you were adjusting the handrail up and down and then yeah. doing all the measurements, right? And so I realized he might not have been your only participant in this study, but was one of them. But I guess I just wondered if there's a practice effect here. Like if you put one participant through the handrail at 32 inches and then at 38 and then at 44 or whatever, is there a practice effect? And because they'll get used to the, you get used to the jiggle that's going to yeah. happen. Um, I don't know. What do you think? I think that's that's an excellent question. Um, so we did look into that to some extent. Um, we we collected four trials per hand real height, and we usually analyze trials for two to four to deal with that, um, to deal with any sort of first trial effects in there. Okay. Um, that's actually what we told reviewers and practices because I didn't want to go through and clean up that many trials because it's a lot of work. But yeah. um, <laughs> we we did some early analyses and found there wasn't a we didn't see a relationship between um, the first trial at a given height versus successive trials at a given height um, for the center of mass and, and torso control measures. Um, we do see small effects on. Um, the accuracy of grasping. So if this is person is reaching a grab and it's their first trial, they're more likely to make an error compared to, to successive trials. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, everyone is able to correct for that and still recover balance. Um, and so yeah, the there we, we do about... see an effective learning. I guess sorry, to the second part of your question, we, we do see an effective learning with repeated exposures, and that's actually been translated to the clinic for fall prevention because people do get so used to the perturbations. Right. Um, but we don't see a systematic relationship between, like there's a differential effect of being used to the platform and, um, and handrail height evaluation. So people simply just withstand higher perturbations, but they grab in the same way. Mm -hmm. And what about a person's height. So I'm one of these shorter people. And so I guess I wonder about whether I would do better with a little bit lower handrail, or I should still go to that high handrail of 44 inches or meters or whatever it was, 44. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, that's, that's also an excellent question. Um, Right, so to clarify, we actually didn't see any performance difference between 42 and 44. So on that basis, I'd say 42, partly because it's legal, um, but also because, again, for people who are shorter or who have limited range of motion in the shoulder, it can get uncomfortable to reach that high. Right. Um, and certainly that's consistent with the um, qualitative feedback from study participants. Um, what I'd say in that case, we we still found no relationship between individual height and grasping speed um, or effectiveness, at least within the range tested. Um, so you'd probably still be okay with 44 or 42. Um, with that said, um, if 38 is more comfortable, I'd go with something like 38 or 40 inches um, because the benefit to performance when you go up to 42 inches isn't that high. Um, like it's, it's barely statistically significant functionally. I don't think it matters. Mm -hmm. Um, but if it's more comfortable and encourages you to walk down the stairs while holding the handrail, um, that's, that's better even at a lower height than what we saw with the higher heights. <laughs> so, yeah. um, I'm noticing there's a few questions in the chat and then oh, is there? Okay. Sally's asked. Yeah. So 
Kat has got something on rocker shoes and how do you compensate for the rocker? Oh yeah. Um, That's, that's a really excellent question. And that's, as far as I'm aware, a fairly major gap in the evidence. Um, You know, I think it's, it's one where um, if you need them for fused toes and, and to walk simply, right. I definitely take the rocker shoe over nothing. Um, I do think that this reinforces the importance of good environmental design and other strategies for avoiding falls. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know how to compensate for the rocker from a forward backward balance standpoint, um, except to work to strengthen your ankles. Um, but that might be one where it becomes a bit more important to ensure that, um, to, to ensure that say the handrails there that you're using it um, and where say exercise programs that focus on um, effective reactive stepping um, and being able to step if you lose balance um, become more important. So wonder, yeah, sorry, that's, that's not a satisfying answer but I think it, it's a cue for everyone else to step up to make your world a bit safer. Great. <laughs> there is one last question and I'm wondering if you might be able to briefly answer it. It's about using walkers and whether the brakes help reduce falls and whether walkers, I know you said they're controversial, significantly reduce core strength and core, and yet they're helpful in preventing falls. So um, any comments about the walkers that you'd like to leave people with? Yeah, that's that's a good question. I'll, I'll touch on this and I'll also get the one on rubberized flooring in, in the chat. Um, so first with walkers, um, so I'll, I'll confess that in the study that we, we ran there, we focused on our data were limited to actual falls. We don't actually have data that we've analyzed on successful instances of balance with and without a walker. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about the effect of brakes that walkers with brakes that slow and lock on fall risk, except um, if it's something that people like for using the walker, that's probably important. Um, uh, does walkers and canes create dependency and reduce core strength and coordination balance? Um, I'm not sure about the evidence on this. And I know it's one that's really difficult to study because people who use walkers and canes are often more likely to need them, right? So by the time you're at that point, there's usually some deficit with balance to begin with independent of walker use. Um, What I will say is that if using a walker is the difference between a person getting up and around versus not, it's hard to tell someone that they should stay in bed for longer because they're worried about a walker creating dependency. Um, So um, I'm I'm not sure that there's any evidence on that because you can still challenge your balance even while using a walker, so. Yeah. uh, sliders for people with foot drops. So is this um or is this orthotics or a different technology? Um, I don't know this part quite as well. <laughs> I'm sorry. No problem. Um, yeah, I haven't looked into that, but that that might be a good question to look into in the future. And then there's the last. Maybe we'll just end with the last question about floor covering. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Rubberized flooring. This is this is loaded. Um, So what Sally is referring to is the flooring in the nursing home where people uh, used video flooring is their special flooring to absorb impact. Um, So the answer to that question is a bit complicated. Um, The videos were collected from two long-term care homes in the lower mainland. um, And one of them was actually also the site of a randomized control trial that dealt with rubberized flooring, but the flooring was um, installed in people's bedrooms. All of the videos that we have are from common spaces, so we don't actually have video evidence from flooring. Um, What I can tell you is that um, with the randomized control trial um, that was focused in in bedrooms, that took place over four years. That was with a technology called smart cells. Um, And this was meant to, we've seen in laboratory experiments that it reduces um, hip and head impact quite significantly Um, at least when we're dropping dummies down onto impact surfaces. Um, We did not see a significant effect of, I shouldn't say we, the people who ran the study did not see a significant effect of flooring on fracture or injury risk. Um, 
the caveat to that is that the study also coincided with when the Fraser Health Authority really upped its game for hip protectors. Um, so in the site where this, um, this study took place, um, I think it's something like 65% of falls involved people wearing hip protectors, um, which may have maybe flooring a lot less important for injury prevention because their body was already padded. Mm -hmm. um, and you might see different outcomes in a site that hadn't done quite so well with upping its general injury prevention game. Um, now, with this said, there are other studies that have shown significance for injury reduction risk with um, a different brand of rubberized flooring. And I apologize, I can't remember that off the top of my head. Um, ultimately, yeah, I, I would expect more injuries from a fall on outdoor pavement. Um, I don't know that there's a large difference between that and a hardwood floor. Certainly, when we've tested in the laboratory, we've seen no differences between um, between wood versus metal. And I think concrete will give us similar results. Mm -hmm. um, and I think at the end of the day, having some something that's a bit softer there to absorb impact is, is, is beneficial. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, this has been really fabulous. And as you can see, there've been lots of questions. So this is an area that we're all interested in, I must say. But I do want to thank you very much, uh, Vicki, for joining us today and sharing this research. And I also want to thank everyone for joining us and encourage you to uh, reach out to Dr. Commissar. Her email address is on the screen there at any time. And as she mentioned, um, Vicki and her team are busy doing studies in this area and so would welcome uh, involvement from um, anyone in the community, there's a role for almost everyone. Uh, so do uh, stay in touch. And uh, we will have Dr. Commissar back again to hear updates on the research, I'm sure. So thank you everyone for joining us and have a great day.